and we are live. Welcome everyone. Uh, we have started the session a little bit late. Sorry about that. Um, that is uh, my fault. And without further ado, um, thank you for all three speakers uh, who are with us right now. Um, and all our participants, obviously. Um, if you guys have this, this needs to be um, a discussion, not just one too many. So all the participation is encouraged. Uh, you can do that by uh, writing your questions, comments in the chat windows, either on Zoom or YouTube. I will be monitoring both. Or if there's any pressing issues, any pressing questions, you can unmute and ask directly to the uh, organizers. Um, and over to you, Kim. Okay, thanks. So this is the academic session. Um, I will start with uh, a talk on Linden Go, which is also a paper that will be published and presented uh, in September at IWPE. Um, I will start with some general introduction on privacy, threat modeling and Linden, and then how we um, created Linden Go as a more lightweight um, variant. And then after that, my colleague Kuhn will uh, take over and we'll talk about um, theory and practice, um, specifically focusing on, on two um, publications. One is related to DFDs and the other is more about the general maturity of, of threat modeling itself. Um, as mentioned, um, we will have some time after each of our talks to discuss. We are really looking forward to all your input and feedback. But if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt. Before I, I jump into the content itself, I like to introduce our research group and myself a bit. So um, both me and Kuhn are um, working at Distrinet. Distrinet is a research group, part of the Department of Computer Science at KU Leuven in Belgium. Um, we are quite a big research group with over 80 people, a lot of senior people also working there. And we mainly focus our research on these three pillars. So distributed software, secure software and software engineering. And clearly threat modeling fits right in there as well. We have quite a, a, a wide range of research activities um, going from the fundamental research, which I guess most of you think of when you think of research and academia, but it goes all the way to ready to market um, research projects. So that means that we closely collaborate with a lot of industry partners. We have been doing that um, for over 30 years now, and that has also led to six spin-off companies. This is me. Uh, I'm a, a postdoctoral researcher, and throughout my, my PhD research and, and uh, now my postdoc years, I have primarily focused on privacy and threat modeling. Um, mainly on, on the Linden method we created, but um, my research focus is also more broad and focuses on software engineering, data protection and security in general. I really like to get in touch with all of you and hear about feedback and comments, so don't be shy and send me an email or connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. So, um, lightweight privacy threat modeling with Linden Go. Um, that is what I will talk in the second part of the of the talk, but just to be sure that everybody is on the same page about what privacy threat modeling is and Linden, I thought I'd give a, a short introduction on that as well. So Linden is a privacy engineering, a privacy threat modeling framework that um, consists of a systematic threat assessment, threat elicitation methodology. For those of you who are familiar with Stride, you will see a lot of similarities because it, because it was inspired by it, um, but then from a privacy perspective now. Um, you can also see it as the architectural part of a privacy impact assessment. Basically, it provides systematic support to elicit and mitigate privacy threats in software systems in architectures. Preferably, this is done early on in the development lifecycle, but of course, you can also apply it to a system that's already up and running. In addition to this method, there's also a privacy knowledge base similar to Stride. So it's all great that you know how to systematically look at each DFD element, but you need to know what you're looking for. You need to know what information you are applying. 
and especially for privacy, which is still quite an unexplored uh, domain. Um, it's great that there is some more um, knowledge behind that. So that are the seven Linden categories. Together they form the acronym Linden. Um, due to time, I will not go into each of them individually, um, but I will just quickly go over them. So you have linkability and identifiability, which closely relate to anonymity um, and to inference. Then you have non-repudiation, which is especially for security people an interesting one because non-repudiation is uh, often a requirement for security, but it can be a threat for privacy because for some kinds of uh, applications in some kinds of domains, you will want plausible deniability. For instance, for an online voting system, it should be possible that you can deny who you voted for. Then there's detectability, um, which is kind of related to side channel attacks. So that means that without actually having access to the data itself, you know it exists and you can deduce information from it. Then the fifth one, disclosure of information. This one is basically just borrowed from Stride because clearly for privacy, you also need confidentiality. And then the final two are unawareness and non-compliance, which we call the softer um, privacy threat categories um, as they are more related to um, compliance concepts such as data, uh, data subject rights and um, data protection principles. This is uh, academic work, um, was created about 10 years ago now, and we're really happy to see that within academia, um, we have quite some, some uh, momentum, uh, quite a number of, uh, of citations, which is nice, but we're mostly proud to see that there is also uh, a growing industry acceptance. Um, Linden has been included in the ISO on privacy engineering, has been mentioned in a couple of opinions and guidelines by the EDPS, by ANISA. Um, but we're mostly happy to get feedback from people in industry saying that they actually apply Linden, that they uh, integrate it with their stride um, um, execution and so on. So we're really happy to see that it's um, finding its way to industry. Um, so if you know Stride, you basically know the basics of Linden as well. Does that mean that it's completely the same? Well, so these are the, the very generic steps of Linden. You model the system, preferably with a DFD. You then elicit threats by mapping them to DFD elements and identifying them using threat trees. And then you manage the threats. Um, so as you can see, it's the main building blocks of strides, it's the the at least already the, the first three of the four questions of Adam Shostak. Should really include the fourth one here as well in the slide. So the, the general method is the same. The difference is, of course, in the knowledge. It's all privacy focused, and that does require kind of a different mindset. Because I will quickly go over this. Um, for security, it's about protecting data in general. For privacy, it's really about personal data. Um, and while a lot of data is actually personal data, things like corporate information is something that is not really considered for privacy, but will be considered for security. But the main difference between security and privacy is the assets and, and basically the, the way you, you look at it. So for security, you are protecting your own assets. As a developer, as a company, you are protecting all the data that you have collected. While from a privacy perspective, you need to think from the perspective of the data subject. So you need to think that data I have collected, I am processing, how will that affect the data subject and the data subject's privacy? So in addition to having for security external attackers, for privacy, it's also a lot about internal misbehavior. Are you collecting or processing or sharing more information than you actually need? Because that would violate the privacy of the data subject. So where for security or at least for confidentiality, it's about preventing unauthorized access to data in general. For privacy, it's more about limiting the consequences of what could happen with personal data 
um, once you, you gain access. So it's more about minimizing data items um, and, and reducing um, the impact basically of sharing that. So in general, it's the same security and privacy threat modeling, but you need to um, basically put on another hat and, and look at it um, a bit different. And then some final words also on the difference between privacy threat modeling and compliance. It's not the same, um, but it can help. So privacy threat modeling is the architectural, the technical part of um, the impact, the privacy impact assessment, which is great to prove that you follow the privacy by design principle that is required um, from the data protection um, legislation. The GDPR also explicitly mentions the need for appropriate technical measures, which is something really hard to prove. But if you can show that you have applied privacy and security threat modeling, that can help to, to, to show that you um, comply with that at design time. But data protection compliance is much more. It's more from the legal angle. You need also to look at legal roles like controllers and processors. You have to define each processing operation, all the data, data subjects, the purpose um, of each of the processing activities. You need to do a, a compatibility assessment. So there's more to it than just the technical part. We're also doing really interesting research on, on this and how to align it with threat modeling, but that is, uh, is more for a, for a different talk. So moving on to, um, to Linden and Linden Go. Um, so just to be sure that you know how Linden and Stride, uh, the elicitation phase works, I want to just zoom into to these steps, um, to this step specifically, and then I will move over to um, Linden Co that we have created recently. So I just showed you this. Um, I will mainly focus on the middle part, so on eliciting the threats. So the first thing you need is you need to have a model of the system. This is typically a DFD, as you see on the left of this slide. Um, this is a very naive, simple example of a social network where you have a user that connects through a portal to a backend service that has some data in a data store. So that's step one, model the system. When you have that system, you will want to look for threats. You will want to look for what can go wrong. And to do so, what you, what you need to have first is a mapping table. So for each of the elements in your DFD, for each entity, process, data flow, data store, you will have one line, one row in uh, the mapping table. And you should look at each of the different Linden categories. There is a mapping template from Linden that shows that not all categories will apply. So you can um, apply this template to the mapping table and already weed out a couple of them. But in essence, what you need to do is you use this big mapping table and you need to iterate over each of the axes and look at that specific um, DFD element and Linden threat category and think about what can go wrong. To help you do this, we I, also have, yeah, sorry. I have a question. Uh, I don't know if you already covered, uh, so apologies if you did. So who would lead this exercise and who would be involved in this exercise? That's a, a great question. Um, it's a bit similar to security, although, um, so, so you will have the, 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 the threat modeling, um, I'm not sure how to call it, champion yes, expert okay. <laughs> to, to, to guide it, but now from a privacy angle. And then you will have the people who know the domain better um, that, that will help you create a model and, and might also help you in this phase. Um, but in the next presentation <laughs> by Kuhn, there is like this, uh, it's not for privacy specifically, but there is an overview of the different steps and who is involved, I think, or at least it's in the paper. Um, so maybe we can come back to this question. Yeah, and we next. can ask people for their uh, opinions as well, because I'm sure some of them already use the framework and they yeah. can share their best practices. Perfect. Well, one, of the, one, 
one other quick question. Would you mind dropping the link to the paper down in the chat? Um, this one? Uh, the, the, the one of Kuhn that will be? The, the one that will be covered. I just wanted to make sure that we have that. Yeah, so um, what I'm talking about now is, is basically Linden in general. So everything will be available on the website. The stuff on Linden Go will be um, in the paper that is not publicly released, I think. And the oh, two papers that Kuhn is presenting, the links are definitely somewhere in one of the, the schedules or, or one of the descriptions, but I, I maybe Kuhn or Steven can already share those in the chat. I see. OK, thank you. OK. Um, any questions, feedback so far? OK. Um, so to think about what can go wrong, you can look similar to um, stride has to um, thread trees. Like there's a, a part of it here um, that shows the most common attack paths. So the most common things that can go wrong for each generic combination of um, Linden category and DFD element type. Um, so, and that way you go through the entire mapping table you look at, at the corresponding tree, taking into account the DFD element and think about what can go wrong. And then of course you document them. You document the threads, preferably you also document all the assumptions you make because they are as important, especially if you reiterate your threat model. So I know I've been rushing, but as it's not a Linden tutorial, but it, I, I'm actually going to Linden Go, um, I, I like to move over there. Um, so, what we saw from my quick rush through Linden, um, although I already skipped a couple of steps in, in my overview, is that it provides systematic support to elicit and mitigate privacy threats in software architectures. The, the main benefits are that you have a really thorough analysis because you go over each of the axes, you go over all of the threes that have all the knowledge for each category, so it's really thorough. And when you document um, that process, you also have traceability or accountability even, which is great for compliance. Um, so it's a really solid um, method similar to Stride. It does require, as you can imagine, when you have to go through this big map mapping table and document everything, it does require quite some time. It's quite complex to do. And we also see that it still requires sufficient expertise on privacy to really grasp all the concepts that are part of the trees. So that made us think. And I actually want to try to make an analogy with food and with cooking. So I hope you bear with me. Um, I was thinking about um, fine dining, like the, the Michelin star restaurant where you have this really exquisite food but it's quite expensive because you really need a master chef to prepare it. And even when you are a master chef, it takes a lot of time to do so. So it's more like a special occasion thing often for most. What you can do is you, try, you can try to recreate it at home. So you get this big recipe from the master chef and you, you, you can try to recreate it at home, but you still need a lot of tools, you still need a lot of experience, expertise to pull this off. Um, you, uh, and you, it will still take you a lot of time. So um, what happens in practice is that we often go for just good food, flavorful, very flavor-wise comparable to the fine dining experience, but without all the fuss, all the bells and whistles, like the foams and the curls and whatever. Um, and that's something we also see happening with Linden, but also with Stride. So rather than being that hobby chef that uses this big recipe, um, which takes a lot of time and experience to execute, which is with some stretch Linden and Stride, um, we see that in practice, people will rather go for the mnemonic for the acronym Linden, or we see the same thing happening for Stride. 
people go for the, the, the main building block, the different categories and apply them themselves. And that's great because if that is sufficient for you to help you, then that's perfect. But there's a side note there because using that mnemonic, it's kind of the same as um, rather than using a recipe, just using the ingredients list. So you have some um, information of what you should use, but not really how and, 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 and the details. So it's great if you can apply this, but you still need to have sufficient experience and expertise to pull this off sufficiently. So that made us think, how can we support this more? How can we still make it lightweight and lower the thresholds, but still keep a comprehensive overview? So that led us to these requirements. We're academics, so we really want to write these requirements out. Um, we have, um, from the methodologi uh, methodological perspective, we want obviously a simple method and reduce as much overhead as possible. So um, can we remove this big mapping table, for instance? But we want to have it uh, still be comprehensive. So we want to have a thorough overview of all the threats. And what we also really like is a more collaborative approach. Um, so also a bit triggered by the question before, who should be involved? It's usually not something you do in isolation. You need to have some interaction with other people. So why not get them um, on board here as well? And then from the knowledge perspective, um, so I mentioned before that to get um, to apply the threat trees, we see that you still need sufficient privacy expertise to, to really grasp all the concepts. So it was important that we had that description as understandable as possible. And preferably also that we had some help to determine whether or not a threat description actually applied to the system that you are examining. So these were the requirements we were starting from. Um, they did not fall from the sky. They're kind of obvious, I think. If you disagree, please let me know what we missed. Um, but they are based on, on years of industry feedback and empirical studies, both on Linden and on Stride. And similar to the creation of Linden itself, for Linden Go, we also looked over the hedge a bit and, and got inspiration from the security side of threat modeling, where you have the really cool elevation of privilege game, uh, which already has some privacy extensions. You also have cue cards and so on. So with these requirements in mind, we created Linden Go, which is a, a toolkit. It's basically a car deck that provides low um, um, threshold support for privacy threat modeling. Um, I will go over how such a card looks like in the next slides. Um, but so the goal is that it still promotes the collaborative aspect of threat modeling. It lowers the threshold and it really guides and inspires you through the process for which we have some new um, elements such as hotspots and um, applicability questions. So I think I already mentioned it before, but I really want to highlight it. Linden Go is really targeted at the elicitation phase. So at the um, what can go wrong step. Um, and how does it work? This is kind of a complex flow to actually say that you have a group of people, let's say four or five, and the first one picks a card and tries to find um, a threat that applies to this card. Uh, when that's found, then the others of the group can help to fill any gaps. And when there is nothing more to be found, then the card is put away and the next person picks a card and you continue that way. So the goal is to get really everybody involved by taking turns picking cards and also by taking uh, turns to fill the gaps. So this is one of the, the cards. It's a, a linkability card. Um, and basically each card has the same structure. You have a title. Then you have something that we call a hotspot. And for people who are familiar with uh, Stride or, or other threat modeling that uses DFD, 
this is kind of like a data flow diagram interaction with additional constraints. So you have here an, an inbound user uh, flow that contains credentials. So what is the goal of this hotspot? It, it gives you some scoping. It helps you determine on which parts of the system this um, thread type can apply. Um, so that can really help you to, to see where the, the thread fits in. Then there's the thread source. As I mentioned, um, when I talked about the difference between privacy and security, there's more than just the external attacker. It can also be um, misbehavior by the system, which we call organizational. Or it can be also that um, a receiver of, um, of a flow of information that is authorized to receive the data itself um, is actually not, well, can, can do more with it. So maybe that receiver is authorized to, um, to query a database and receive information, but the, the data that he or she receives is so specific that um, even though assumed to be anonymous, you can deduce information. So the receiving party can, without actually being an, an attacker, can get more information than they should. Then there is a summary. Um, so the two applicability questions I mentioned before is also to help really determine whether such a, a threat type applies to your system that you are looking for, uh, looking at. So the first question is, um, does it apply to my system? And the second is more, is it a problem to my system? Then there are some examples to help you understand um, what it's all about. What we also noticed, um, especially through the early dry runs, that sometimes um, people still had issues to, to see like, so what's the big deal now about these threats? So we also included an impact or consequences overview. So why is this actually a problem? Why is it important to think about it? Then there's some additional information, which can be some more details, some information about mitigation solutions, um, some links with other categories, so on. We always highlight which Linden category it applies to, and each card has an identifier. So those hotspots, they are, we basically only have these five. So you have inbound flows, outbound flows, storage and retrieval of data in a data store, and processes. Um, but, but each of them also has some subtypes where there's maybe actors, human actors involved, where there's specific types of data that are being um, communicated. And that way, these hotspots can really um, scope uh, the, the places where you need to look at um, in your model to, to see whether the threat applies. Um, so we have the threat types, we have the, the, uh, the way to, to um, apply it. In addition, there's also this background information on the different Linden Go categories. So we have a card for each category where the front has some more explanation about the threat category itself. So what is this? A bit more information. And again, the so what, what does it mean? And in the back, there's an overview of the hotspots so of the places in the system where these uh, threats are likely to occur. So basically, when you have when you look at the category cards, we have six for Linden Go. You have um, a very quick overview of what can go wrong here. So just to let you know, we have six cards, but the acronym is actually seven. We decided for Linden Go to not focus on uh, disclosure of information because that's the one we borrowed from security, and we really wanted to get the focus here on the privacy-specific parts. Um, and anyway, when you do a privacy assessment, you should also do a security um, assessment. So something like Stride should be executed anyways. So you can use these um, category cards as background information, or if you prefer to use the, the acronym itself as, as main input for your threat assessment, 
then I think these six cards already give you some more information than just the term linkability or identifiability, and also will get you um, started to do what we call a freestyle um, approach to Linden Go. So the bottom one here is an alternative, the freestyle or the, the one where you just look at the categories. We also have some other variants where you um, do not include the other part, uh, the other um, people in, in the group that you only, the person who picks a card should elicit threats. You can time box it. You can include some um, um, scoring to make it more fun and turn it into a game. That was actually our original idea, but some tests showed that there was not really that much appetite, at least uh, for our participants. Um, and that everybody just really focused on finding the threats and forgot to actually keep score. So we thought, well, let's stick to the to the main purpose, to the privacy threat modeling and have the fun part as an add-on. So you're saying the privacy people don't know how to have fun? Wow, we think it's already fun without scoring. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good one. Um, but then, of course, you can also use the cards just as some some catalog um, to use as as uh, as you do your threat modeling exercise, maybe alone or just uh, to have as as background information. Um, so I kind of rushed through it, I guess. Um, if you want to try it, if you want to find out more about Linden in general. You can find everything on the website, linden.org. It's all publicly available. There is a catch though. We really, really like feedback. So please get in touch. Um, when you, you download the Linden Go card, there's also, uh, I think there's still a link to a questionnaire, which we really like you to fill out. Um, and if you're very interested in Linden Go, we still have some um, printed out copies. So if that's something you would want to use, get in touch, and I can see how I can get you some um, some cards. So as resource, I would just guide you to Linden Go, uh, to linden.org. Um, I can make you some recommendations of things to read if you are new to, to privacy, privacy engineering. Yeah, and of course, if you're new to threat modeling, the, the book by Adam Shostak is also highly advised. Um, so that was my quick rush through Linden and the introduction of Linden Go. Any questions or feedback is, is very welcome. Before we move over to Kuhn, I had some questions in mind if, if anybody would like to comment on if you would apply it yourself or maybe you have already applied it, how would you do it? Would you do it in group? Would you use it as a catalog? Are you more a fun person that, that really wants to play it as a game? Um, would you do the freestyle, so the categories only? And how, in future research, can we further help you out? What would you like to see added um, to Linden Go or to Linden in general? Um, like, is it more, do you also want to get some more on the next step, on the, the, the mitigations? Um, that's something we are already looking into. Another research angle we're looking into is more domain-specific things. So for a specific domain, you can already scope a number of threads that are more likely or less likely to uh, occur. Um, maybe you're just interested to get more overall privacy backgrounds, like you, you use the categories and you want some background information about that, but you don't want to be bothered with cards or with trees. So basically any comments or feedback would be very appreciated. Okay. Shoot. Oh, sorry. I was just yeah. saying, I was just thinking an OPSEC version of these cards would be awesome. Okay. Um, just looking at some of the, the information on them. I mean, it, it lends to it as it is. Um, I was just thinking in terms of what would draw more people to look at them and what would, you know, kind of put it out there more. I think an OPSEC version would be something that would for sure, you know. And how, uh, how what does that define? So how? for instance, like your, um, your oh, uh, so you're talking about privacy, right? Yes. Um, what about someone who is looking to have, you know, kind of like what uh, 
an extreme privacy, basically. Um, like they, they want to be able to do um, information security tasks and stuff um, without, you know, having, as one of your cards said, you know, they create a fingerprint by, you know, doing various things by, mm -hmm. um, so like, how can an individual apply it to their operation security as far as, um, you know, with information security, that would be a very interesting perspective to, to gear the cards towards. I think a lot of people would, would uh, tune in, you know, with that. Okay. Good suggestion. I really, I already, really need to think about it. Thanks. I, I already actually started applying some of the things in my head that I was seeing as far as like how that would work. I was like, okay, you know, okay. You just, it's just little, little tweaks here and there and you can put out, you know, a different set of cards that would be similar, hold similar principles, um, but be checking, you know, how is your OPSEC? Yeah. Interesting. Okay, I, I would but, love to get yeah. in touch and 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 ping pong about that um, later on yeah. if if you're and interested. The easiest way to do it is to join our Slack um, because we already have uh, some people talking about this stuff. Uh, I will post the links in in the chat window in a minute. And Alessandro, I think you were saying something. Uh, well, I was saying that uh, question reminded me of. Um, the elevation of privilege game that could be used as a baseline, for example, to uh, on the previous question, um, basically to to adapt, um, let's say this uh, this model Linden on an application security perspective. Um, it might be. I, I don't know if you ever heard of um, of this, and uh, if you think this could be useful. Maybe the elevation of privilege game, you mean? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, no. So, so definitely the elevation of privilege game was, was uh, definitely an inspiration here. Um, what made us move, well, it's, it's not content wise, but it, it was more um, style wise, especially for privacy, but also when we have students who were not that familiar with security applied, we had the feeling that that one sentence on the card was not sufficient, that they needed more information. So that's why we put a lot of information on our cards. Yeah, but, but, I actually but, agree and I love that. Uh, it's uh, especially, you know, the part where uh, that you added on the bottom left, where you actually explain on possible implications on that. It is something that normally requires a lot of energy uh, when you're doing this exercise to explain to people also outside of the Linden context. So for example, when you apply the elevation privilege, so it's very useful to have actually this information in the card and uh, I really love that. Yeah, but so content wise to, to bring it down to that, that, that level, that's a, a good suggestion, thanks. And any other practitioners who can share some of their uh, methods and what worked best for them? Do we have any not in the a, audience? Not a practitioner, but do have a question about applying it. Um, with the current uh, COVID situation, are you planning or do you have an online version of the game? Uh, yeah, that question that's... arose already a couple of times. So we really, yeah, really enough. need to look into that. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Th there has been some brainstorming about using Miro, I think. And, and to get that in there, but I'm not sure whether that will roll out so so easily. So we're looking into how we can can support that better. Yeah. Yeah. His, historically, with um, threat modeling sessions, uh, I've never quite figured out how to do elevation of privilege remotely well with a team. Um, okay. And yeah. I'd, any I'd, suggestions I'd... there would be great. Yeah. <laughs> I I wish I had some. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't. <laughs> But yeah, an online version would be awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So shall we move to the more um, generic threat modeling talk um, by Kuhn? Of course, we can still zoom into privacy if there's anything that pops up later. Sure, and Kim is here for the duration of the session. So if any sure. questions, we can we can ask her. 
Okay. Welcome. Okay. Hi. Hi. I will share my screen now. Okay. Uh, bum, bum, bum. So does this this shows up for everybody? Yes. I didn't test that yet. Okay. So welcome to the second part of of this session, and it's more uh, a more general look at uh, threat modeling from uh, an academic and a practical point of view. So in this part, um, I basically have two goals. Uh, the first is to give you a, a kind of an academic view on threat modeling based on two position papers that we wrote, one on the maturity of threat modeling as an engineering discipline, and one on the use of data flow diagrams for threat modeling. And uh, for you, what, what we would like to know is what are your concerns regarding threat modeling as a practitioner? So what are the major hurdles that you encounter, your crucial constraints that we should take into account as researchers? Um, how would threat modeling happen in an ideal world? Well, not the idealist world where there are no attackers, but um, what would be the, the best way to do threat modeling according to you, forgetting all the practical constraints and uh, especially interesting for us because we uh, try to focus on automation is how do you see the role of automation in, in threat modeling? So first, who am I? So, uh, so that you know, I'm a colleague of Kim. I'm a research manager on secure software engineering at the Strinet at uh, K. Leuven in Belgium. So my research interests are basically on everything related to secure software engineering, uh, security by design and threat modeling, uh, software architecture and design, model-based security, security requirements engineering, and so on. So. Um, if you want to reach out to me, uh, I have some uh, links at the bottom, email or Twitter, or you can look at my uh, publications of me and the group at the URL there. So this paper, uh, this presentation in particular is based on uh, two publications. Uh, I linked them here and uh, I also saw that the links were shared already uh, in the chat. Um, and so let's start with the first one, the maturity of threat modeling. So um, we consulted with, uh, with Torion on how they typically do uh, a threat modeling uh, for, for a company. And this is the process that we extracted from it. So how they typically work is they initiate the threat modeling with, with a kickoff meeting where they explain to all the participants there, uh, what the purpose is. Then they do a modeling session or uh, perhaps several modeling sessions where they try to um, get a grip on what is the system that we're actually dealing with. Um, first in a rather chaotic session maybe, and then afterwards one of the uh, experts will refine the model that comes out of that. Uh, based on that model, then the next session will be the threat elicitation session, which is also again uh, refined by an, LSA, by, by an uh, expert. And then in the end, uh, finalization, uh, which eventually leads to a report and a review meeting of the, the threats that were found and suggestions for mitigations. So in practice, and I'm probably oversimplifying here a bit, but this session, the, the modeling session would be uh, using uh, or creating a data flow diagram on a whiteboard. And for eliciting the threats, a stride or some variant of stride might be used. And then here at the end, in the finalization, it's probably Microsoft Word or something to create the actual report. So this is the view that we have as academia from how threat modeling happens in practice. And uh, this was one, uh, the, the process of one particular company, but it corresponds to uh, the ideas that we had. Uh, so I would like to know if your process is totally different than this. It's useful to know uh, how you do threat modeling, um, but this is kind of the reference that we have in mind. 
If you look at threat modeling in academia, there are two um, recent surveys, one from 2018 and one from 2019, about threat modeling and how it appears in the academic literature. And I put some quotes here, which do not really uh, give a very flattering picture. So one quote says, uh, threat modeling is a diverse field lacking common ground. The definitions are numerous and used in many different and perhaps also incompatible ways. Uh, another, uh, the, the other survey says uh, something similar. The existing techniques lacking quality assurance of outcomes and the techniques lack maturity validation and tool support. So if we look at these two um, surveys, they, they paint a picture um, about threat modeling where they say it covers a lot of approaches. So it's not just stride and attack trees, but there are many more things that are also uh, represented as, as threat modeling in the, in the academic literature, uh, formal and mathematical approaches, uh, generation of security tests, etc., are things that are also covered under the threat modeling umbrella. Um, from an academic point of view, we also have no dedicated community or venue where, we, where people only publish on, on threat modeling. So the publications that do exist about threat modeling are, are scattered a bit around different research domains, so different conferences, different journals, some on requirements engineering, some on software engineering, some on the more security specific ones. So it's really hard to get a good view on what is uh, threat modeling in academia because there's no one go-to place to learn everything about it. Now, furthermore, there is a lack of experience reports and case studies. And this is a kind of a, a call to practitioners. If you do have these things, um, you can uh, write these up and share them with, with others, or you can contact us and we can look at doing something together to really also spread the knowledge on what is the experience with, with threat modeling, what works, what doesn't work, how did we apply it in this particular case, and so on. This helps other researchers and other uh, practitioners. And then finally, uh, we found, or the surveys found, uh, and we agree with that, that there's a, a lack of scientific or emp empirical evaluation of threat modeling. So which approaches work well, which work better, what is a better way to do it? Um, it doesn't really happen that much. Okay, so in general, there's quite a low level of maturity in that sense of threat modeling in, in academia, but I think also in practice. And it remains largely uh, a manual effort, uh, not really guided by a lot of uh, good processes or tools. And there's a gap between what academia does and what practitioners need. So one of the goals of this talk is to think about how we can uh, address this. And in one of the papers, we outline six criteria that we believe are uh, necessary for if somebody in academia would come up with uh, an improved threat modeling approach, for instance, what, what do we believe are success criteria for having this approach being adoptable in practice? It might also be useful to, when I present this, to think about your current approach and see whether it fulfills these criteria and whether you think they are indeed necessary or not. So first criterion that I didn't list is, of course, is, is the approach uh, functionally sound? Does it actually help you identify threats? That's kind of a no-brainer, but these are six more non-functional criteria around that. So a first uh, element that we believe is necessary is that threat modeling revolves around building a model that helps you find, uh, and that model should help you in finding gaps and ambiguities in what you have done so far. And an important constraint that we, uh, that we heard about is that the model must somehow facilitate the process of threat modeling, but should not restrict it. So you don't want to be restricted by having to adhere to a particular model, but the model should help you uh, while, uh, while creating it. For, instance, for example, by highlighting, okay, you mentioned here, uh, for example, the existence of a certain component or process, but you didn't say anything about that yet, or uh, it, isn't it isn't included 
um, in your model yet. Second criterion is that um, what you do, that your process is traceable. So um, we think it's essential that you can explicitly record the rationale and assumptions and link these to the threat models, because these contain very important information about threats that you do and don't consider. So this should be explicitly recorded and not remain in the head of one of the experts that does the exercise. Related to that is that the process should be uh, systematic. So you want uh, correct, complete and repeatable results, which do not just rely on the particular expert that you were able to, to drag in. Um, if you repeat the exercise, you want some, uh, some guarantees that you will get at least a similar outcome. Maybe not exactly the same, but not uh, far off. And there we think automation and tools uh, should be uh, used as a support. They probably, it's probably not possible to have them take over the whole process, but they should um, give some support at least. Another criterion is the integration with the business. So threat modeling will, might give you uh, technical risks, might give you technical threats, and you somehow need to identify or, or relate that to the business risks. I think it was also already mentioned at the end of, of Kim's talk, where you say, okay, this is a, a threat, and what is the impact of that? We believe that that's also uh, important for threat modeling in general, and also integrate this in the, in the risk management of the organization where you're doing the threat modeling. Uh, the fifth criterion is that your threat model should fit in the context and the culture of the enterprise. So if they already have certain uh, building blocks in place for security, if they adhere to certain patterns, they have a certain architectural style that they're using in the business, then your threat model uh, approach should align with that. And uh, it should work seamlessly within that. And related to that is uh, attention to change management. So eventually the goal is to have this threat modeling uh, as a continuous activity and not a one-off thing that you do once or twice in a year for your application. And so you also need to um, fit within the, the culture of the enterprise and how they handle change. And then the final and also an important one, I think, is the scalability. So um, your threat modeling approach, if, if you propose a threat modeling approach, it should be able to scale up for large systems and large organizations with lots of teams, lots of uh, different projects that go together in that one system. But on the other hand, it should also be possible to scale it down for small systems and small teams where you maybe don't need all the overhead or uh, you don't need a heavyweight uh, process. So if we take those criteria, these kind of delineate the, the, the box or the area in which, um, in which we can work on threat modeling. And we see uh, for the way forward, we see, we, we try to define five maturity levels for, uh, for threat modeling. So the first maturity level is, is, is the initial one, the ad hoc one, where some efforts happen, but there's not a rigorous, standardized, repeatable process. And that appears in the, in the um, second and third level. So in the second uh, maturity level, um, you would have a good understanding of what threat modeling is, what it is not. Uh, you have a reference model. In the third level, you follow a well-defined process where you have uh, low variance in the end result. So um, that's what I said before. You don't want it to depend on the precise uh, person or expert that performed uh, the modeling. Um, at the fourth level, you would also be able to measure how well your threat modeling process works in practice. And the fifth level, you instantiate the feedback loop uh, and more quality assurance and automation based on those metrics. Um, our position, and it's my intention in this presentation to give a few controversial statements which might lead to um, discussion. This is uh, one of the first of these, I think. 
Um, our position is that currently threat modeling as an engineering discipline is currently still at a very low level of maturity. So both in terms of the research, the tool support and uh, the way it happens in practice. And then uh, also in this paper where we uh, describe this, we highlight a few research challenges that we see to move, uh, to move threat modeling up on this uh, maturity ladder or down uh, on this slide. So to move from level one to two, um, we believe that it's necessary to create a reference model for threat modeling. And a part of that is a model that allows you to exchange threat model information. So what, what is a threat model exactly? What do you need to write down? What are the artifacts that you need to produce when you're uh, threat modeling? And how can you write that down in a consistent way so that you can share it with somebody else? So that's the, the sharing part. Share it as an example, as a, as, a, as a case study, but also within one company, if uh, you repeat the exercise at a later time, that you still have some, or some other uh, consultant comes in from a different company so that they can reuse what has been done before. And moving to, to level three, based on, on that model, um, the goal is to reduce the importance of, uh, of the particular expertise of the people that, uh, that perform it by defining a process. So that everybody who should be threat modeling can, can also do it. Um, <clears throat> what we believe to be necessary here is a, a better structured, a more structured way of, of modeling, of creating the model, of creating the threats, writing down the rationale and assumptions, and not just um, the end results. This is a list of threats that we that we came up with. This will be um, a bit more covered in, in the second part of this talk on the on the data flow diagrams. And besides the structured modeling, we also think that you should here use uh, or make available knowledge bases um, to capture the knowledge, to reuse the knowledge, and don't depend on the particular knowledge or expertise of one particular uh, individual. To move to level four, we need uh, metrics. So the fourth step of Adam Shostak uh, is how do, is check that you did a good job. Um, the question here is if you would want to measure it, how do you know that you did a good job? What are valid metrics to assess the quality of a threat model? How would you measure, okay, this was, uh, this was a good threat model and this was, uh, was a bad one? And how would you um, would you, are you able to check that your threat model still corresponds to, to reality? Can you make prediction based on it? And so forth. And then for the fifth level, um, you would use those metrics to instantiate a feedback loop. And once you have that feedback loop, you can go for continuous uh, updates to your threat modeling. Um, automation can be uh, applied here and you can go to a dynamic self-adaptive uh, thread also imagine your system is running and based on information that is collected and the metrics of your thread model at a certain point you detect that uh, some of the threads that you deemed less important before become more important now and your system can automatically um, react to that and instantiate new countermeasures, for instance. This would be what we see as, as level five. Okay, so that's our view for, uh, for threat modeling as a whole. And I will now zoom in to one particular aspect of threat modeling, and that's the use of data flow diagrams of DFDs. So as I said, this is part of the structured modeling uh, of our maturity model. And maybe this is a good point to, to first ask for your experiences on using uh, data flow diagrams for threat modeling. So first of all, do you use data flow diagrams? Uh, what do you use them for? Why do you use data flow diagrams? And what are, according to you, the, the limitations of them? So if somebody wants to share something. Open to the floor. 
let me start now. Uh, you already know this, Kuhn, because we work together with you to actually uh, fill this out. So mm -hmm. we use data flow diagrams primarily as a tool to speak the same language across uh, different groups of people. So people with different roles and people speaking different languages. Um, that's why we use them. Uh, that's what we use them for. They are somewhat limited. So what we do include each time is at least some text under uh, the data flow diagram. Um, if extra uh, explications or, or details are needed in order not to uh, overcrowd the text in the data flow diagram itself. So in my case, um, we use them a lot, I would say. Um, I personally like to use them because uh, it makes you visualize the uh, components of what you're analyzing and it's easy to, to visualize the trust boundaries. So you can have a discussion on, on the data flow and all the components involved and uh, basically have a better, uh, I would say common understanding on, um, on what we're actually looking at and uh, what we're, we're, on what we're trying to model. So just adding to that, historically, whenever I've done this with engineering teams, I'll use their diagrams that they have provided or work with them to draw effectively the DFD. Um, if, if diagrams already exist and they're not quite DFD, but they are close enough, um, then that, uh, that is generally good enough for a, for a first go round of the threat model. Um, the other thing is sometimes when you get into some of the more complex um, uh, or lower level details of the threat model, DFD isn't sufficient. So if there are sequence diagrams for particularly complicated areas, uh, I often find those, again, if the engineering teams already produced them, to be very useful. <clears throat> okay, thanks. So, so that's the, the behavior part that is missing from the data flow diagrams then. Yeah, it, it's if you have, um, uh, if you say, uh, uh, well, take something like OAuth as a, as a fairly good example. There's three or four yeah. parties involved uh, with, with data that's transitioning across, uh, across different uh, or through different boundaries, some of which is trusted by one, not by another. And the sequence diagram allows you to look at uh, yeah. that flow in more detail. Um, it, it's lower level than the initial one. Yeah. OK. Somebody else with, uh, somebody else still has a different use case or opinion. If not, um, I'll continue then with what we think are uh, the strengths and weaknesses of using data flow diagrams for, for threat modeling. We, we did one of these um, for the COVID apps just recently. And that was a very interesting session. We could move things around um, into different areas as we talked about it. You know, it, didn't, it wasn't just something that was static in, the, in that while we were all looking at it, we could talk about moving it to a different area and having it shifted over here. And yeah, if you had it print, you know, it'd be static, but that kind of thing enables um, communication about what the expectations are more, um, what the directions change over time type things. Um, and then you could even talk about, okay, well, if this is our first implementation, you know, what, what can we do after that to, to improve the threat model? um you know that kind of thing like oh yeah. Uh, so, yeah okay so yeah. more dynamic not just the diagram uh, per se but the the process of creating it and the fact that you can move things around and, and the the microphone tool sorry um apologies so the microsoft threat modeling tool is really good for that but it doesn't provide history and having a history with the model would be awesome 
Yeah. And a history that specifically, I think that um, involves the communication. Um, yeah. I think that that's something that we may have gained through the, uh, through the video conferences that, you know, a, a perspective on that. You want to have it, you know, something that changes, but you also want to have the dialogue that you can review to see, okay, this is why it changes this way. And that's, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah, it's one of the one of the things we were uh, actually thinking about. Um, I think it will it will come back here. Um, it's kind of like thinking to a, a domain specific language where you don't just capture the final model, but the language that allows you to to describe changes that you do. And then some tool can process it to create the intermediate models. But you can say, for instance, okay, we we move this process out of that process, for instance. Um, I really capture that along with the rationale why you did it, rather than just say, okay, now we delete that one and we replace it by two others uh, and check that new version in Git. But really have the, the change actions as first class citizens of the language. It's one of the things we're uh, thinking about as one of the research tracks. So I don't know if that would, would resonate with you as something useful yeah most definitely um i'd like to see how, how it plays out in the the way that you're thinking about it that'd be that'd be cool to see okay okay so some of the uh, strengths that we see in in data flow diagrams and they were already mentioned i think it's it's <laughs> The biggest strength, I think, is that it's really uh, a simple notation. So it's very accessible. You can you can draw it on a whiteboard. Um, people that don't know very much about software engineering can still understand what's going on. So that's that's a strength why this is a, a good thing to have. It's technology agnostic, so you're not tied to any frameworks or middlewares or paradigms like like object oriented programming. It's just about the the high level view of your application. And it allows you where it's necessary to decompose elements. So you can take a process and you can say, okay, this is a big one. Let's decompose it into to smaller things. So these are the strengths. And also, for instance, Stride aligns well with these things. It gives you pointers on where to, where to look at uh, for certain threads. But then we also uh, found uh, some shortcomings or weaknesses in the context of, of thread modeling. So we have uh, four, and they're basically all related to making certain assumptions more explicit. So the first one would be uh, the lack of uh, security concepts. So a data flow diagram is used for a security analysis, but by itself, it's not security oriented. So one addition that happened already is adding the trust boundaries. Um, but we think that's not enough on the one hand and on the other hand we think the trust boundaries are overused and have uh, too many different meanings so how would you represent security context uh, concepts on a data flow diagram uh, typically this happens in a very uh, informal or incomplete incomplete way so an existing countermeasure for instance like i highlighted a few on the example data flow on the right you can add a, a, a note where you say, okay, this is encrypted, but what exactly do you mean with encrypted there? Does, does the process itself, does the application itself encrypt it on a message level or do you use TLS on the underlying connection or is it, does it go over IPsec? You cannot know from just saying encrypted. And you could, you could add that, but that uh, still gives you other problems. So it's, it's just a label. The same for the attacker model assumptions, like I said, the, the trust boundaries. What exactly does it mean if you draw a trust boundary? The figure on the right has three of them, but what, what exactly does that mean for the, for, the, um, for the attacker model? Do you assume that the attacker is not in the hospital on the left, or is the attacker only on the outside of, of, uh, of all the trust boundaries? What do the nested trust boundaries mean? There's no clear semantics there. Um, uh, and labeling things does not really uh, help you. What we see here as, as uh, a research challenge is thinking about what are the concepts that you actually should model or include in, uh, in your diagram, in your model, 
and how can you model them on a way that that is not uh, ambiguous anymore? And it, it almost seems like that's part of a part of what the model is actually useful for, though, is creating that common language. Why are you using this? This doesn't make sense to me. This makes sense to me. Like it's that development of that common language and the reason for each of the things being in the position they're in that you know kind of comes sure. from it. That yeah. makes sense. And are you then talking about the the particular the the more let's say the functional parts of the application? And the, yeah, um, even about the deployment, like what is where and who talks to who. Yeah, even uh, the labels and where you have the trust boundaries and everything like that. The language that you're using to communicate in that in that given situation that you're using it kind of comes from um, the conversation that goes with it. You know, it's not mm -hmm. in yeah. general seems like it's not just the diagram itself that actually presents the most uh, impactful insight. It's kind of that whole bundle. Yeah. And I think that touches upon the, the core of, the, of, the, of the, the point of this paper in the end is that, okay, you can recreate the precise semantics for every project that you do. If you go to client A, you say, okay, with the trust boundary, we, we mean this. If you go to another client, you may mean something else with the trust boundary. And that's fine, but that, that doesn't really help. If you remember the maturity levels, that doesn't really help sharing the, the artifacts because you, you also need to be able to share that whole reasoning behind it. And it makes it more difficult to, to make it, uh, to, to present it in a uniform way. So, um, so one of the uh, discussion points that's come up before when uh, we've been doing threat modeling is, do you include threats and uh, countermeasures and mitigations for existing things? Uh, some, pe some people have the view that, well, if you take um, encrypted transport TLS, that you just shouldn't bother uh, writing in the threats and you shouldn't bother writing in the mitigations as it's taken as read. But if you don't, your threat model isn't complete. Um, it's interesting here because I, historically, I haven't represented any mitigations or countermeasures on the actual DFT themselves. I've always pulled them out uh, separately. So with this, do you, um, would you view the existing mitigations or countermeasures are added to the DFD as part of the standard process? And then the extra ones that you identify that aren't present are handled further down. Yeah, so I, I would say like the first time you do a threat model and you have not thought about security or, or, or anything, you would start with an empty with the DFD without any of the countermeasures, and then if you yep. decide to add some, or if some are already in place, like if you interact with some with some external service that already requires some some I don't know uh, uh, some particular authentication mechanism or so, you can already include that on the DFD, and you can start focusing on what could go wrong with that authentication mechanism. If you know, for instance, that you're doing TLS, you can include that, but then that might trigger other questions like what do you do with the uh, with the certificates with uh, trusting the certificates might lead to new threats that are also important to um, yeah to take care of so that's why okay. i think this this information is really important to to include it somewhere and to keep track of it oh yeah absolutely um it's just the case of where do you install do you do you put it on the dfd or do you put it as a uh, do you put it in the set of threats and mitigations that come out of uh, yeah. this discussion? Yeah, and that's that's indeed still, I don't have an answer to, to that question because the DFD might get very overloaded if you try to cram every little security detail that you know about in the graphical view. It's probably not that useful anymore to do it. In our, in our view, there would be a, a model behind this. The DFD is one view or representation of it, but in the model, you can attach the things to the right places. Yeah, I would not add it to the DFD, things like encrypted, um, because yeah, it doesn't really tell you a lot, but it comes in either the, the accompanying text 
or when you do the stride analysis, uh, at least we always split it up into mitigations that are planned and then well, potential threats. Um, it's important to note that further on in the threat model, everything that you note here, for example, like encrypted, um, becomes an actual requirement because at least in theory, you're doing a threat model on a design. So nothing has been built yet. So everything you detail in the data flow diagram, uh, I always try to put it in text as well because that makes it clear it is now a requirement. And if either during the later uh, QA phase or the build phase, it appears that it cannot be done for some reason, then you need to come back to the team that made the threat model saying like, okay, guys, uh, this encryption stuff, uh, we're actually not going to do it. How is that impacting your threat model? Yeah. Um, I tend to see this as a um, threat modeling as an uh, iterative process. So where, for example, the data flow, the, the DFT, it's something that um, also changes in, uh, in scope uh, as much as you go forward uh, with your analysis. So it's not something that I see as happening, for example, once a year, I was mentioned before, but even more often. So for example, in the DFT shown in the slide, you might have a first session where you uh, start having a global understanding of what are the possible threat in this picture. And then you might scope down and discuss, for example, about the cloud storage or let's say LDAT encryption, and maybe trying to analyze what could be the possible threat that you would have uh, on that specific component. So how are you encrypting data? How is storing credential and so on? Um, yeah, so it's, um, uh, yeah, well, that's in my case, is so thinking about this as an exercise that uh, it's um, continuous and uh, it's being iterated over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that comes back to the to the point of maintaining the history of what happened to the threat model, not just within one session, but also uh, across sessions or across time uh, to be able to, also the traceability, like, okay, if in the end, in the implementation phase, you say this encryption is not going to work, that you can come back and look at, at the impact of why did we need the encryption? What are the threats that were mitigated by it? And, what will happen to them if we don't do it? And the one that we're creating as a consequence of the mitigation, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the, the lack of the security concepts was, was one of the uh, shortcomings, but we still have a few others. So another one, and this is perhaps a bit weird, it's a data flow diagram. But data is left, uh, is, is kept very informally on, on a typical DFD. So it's a set of labels that you assign to the arrows, but it becomes very tricky to identify the type of data or to track some specific data through the DFD. So for instance, if you have here health data and health data encrypted, is that exactly the same data? Is that something else? If you think about uh, 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 credit card processing, can you really see based on the labels where uh, the different parts of the credit card, where the, the CVV code, where it goes, where it doesn't go, um, because it can have different labels and that makes it difficult to track that data item through the DFD. Um, another thing you cannot really model, and I think it's also very important to, to be explicit about that, is what data is actually just data and what data is data that eventually is treated as code and is executed. If you're sending JavaScript to a browser, then eventually that thing is executed. Um, if you're sending a, a, a database query or a SQL statement to a database, that thing is executed. So these things are important from a security point of view, but there's not really um, a good way to model it. So like always, you can add text, you can add labels, but that means that everybody uh, does it on their own way and there's not really a good model to capture these things in. Um, similar with the sensitivity level, some data is more important than others for your threat model. Some has to be kept confidential, some is public. How can you, um, how can you actually model the data that lies at the basis of your, of your application? So all these discussions about the data flow diagrams brings a question to my mind, which might have already an answer, but I don't 
and I don't know it. Are there any standards for doing the data flow diagrams? Uh, for it's like everybody just goes and does them in their own way. Uh, uh, for data flow diagrams, well, there's, there's the notation, but even there, I think there are three or four different standard notations for data flow diagrams. Um, but for actually um, creating a data flow diagram really as a model, um, I don't think there are any, any standards for that. So maybe that might be a next step for the industry to build one to, so that we don't have to end up creating one for each company we work for. Yeah, but, and it's, it's exactly on that point where, where we are asking the question, like, should we just formalize the data flow diagram on itself? Or because we know that we're using it for threat modeling, should we think about maybe a more threat modeling specific language which can, which can be based on data flow diagrams, but it can contain some other things uh, as well and standardize that specifically for threat modeling rather than starting from the data flow diagram itself. But then you start from the assumption that you want to have a unified language. Maybe mm -hmm. most companies are not really interested in a unified language. They only need to understand their own data flows or their own models. And a model by definition is never complete or perfect. So mm -hmm. maybe most companies are not really interested in a unified way of doing it. That's something that consultants like me would like because it makes my life easier. But as long as they understand what is in their data model and as long as they have described, this is how we do it, that will work perfectly for them. So. Uh, maybe the, let's say, the unification of the, of the language is not something that is actually having a very uh, broad traction within the industry. Yeah, that's, that's possibly a good point. I think if we would have things like certification where you have to produce certain documents to show that you're compliant to uh, or that you did certain security um, that you did threat modeling and that certification process would, would uh, give you some template on what you have to produce exactly, then that unified language might become more interesting um, if it's part of or if it can be used to just generate that kind of documentation, but might give more of a push towards using it, I think. But I also, I, I, I buy the point of view that if, if a company just um, because that then well, wants to get the that, job done. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, something like GDPR hints at doing threat modeling. Now, what you're showing here, starting off with a data model or a data flow diagram or, or any kind of a model, is typical for uh, methodologies uh, like the one that Adam Chostak describes in his book and a couple of others. Mm -hmm. It's a whole bunch of uh, that modeling methodologies out there that don't start from data flows that mm -hmm. can equally well be used to be compliant to any of this legislation. So even there, a unified language would not really help or let's say that the certification bodies might want not to go for it because you exclude a bunch of methodologies that way. Yeah. So I think that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. It, it seems like, um... From, from one side, um, the uh, creating different methods of using this and different functionality and showing how those would work with, with the data flow diagram um, would be useful. On the other side, I get kind of where you're going with it too. Um, and I think it would be interesting if we could actually um, figure out a way to uh, kind of study the data behind the data flow diagrams and actually the functionality, um, how would you put like it? Of, open source baseline, like people can use or choose not to use. I mean, yeah, but I, I do think that there there is, I mean, that would definitely be useful. I'm sure of that. Um, I was, I guess, thinking that if you wanted to pursue a direction of being able to look at them from a kind of um, 
data-based angle versus the like thought organization based angle um it would be interesting to see how it was brought down to uh into automation you know of not only creation but also um being able to have the data and you know deriving information from the data of these kinds of uh processes um but i do think that that's kind of perhaps a separate thing than um the way that data flow diagrams are typically and traditionally used. Does that make yeah. sense? Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm interested in, in more like learning more about the direction you're thinking of and where you're wanting to go with that, because I have a similar idea with a different area, but the recognition of the, of the difference between where it, it's used in general practice and what could be done with it in a specific um in a more kind of i don't know how you put it uh more automated way more you know uh standardized and um kind of rigid way um that that would be more useful in a different area. And I'm, I'm interested in talking with you about that and just finding out more like yep. how those kinds of things could be uh, furthered because that's that connects to a, an entirely different uh, type of field, I think, than most are really um, pushing towards at this point. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah, but we should definitely follow up on that uh, after, after this session then. But I, I do think that what he was saying, you, you know, if you if you have different methodologies that you use with um, the data flow diagrams and make those available for the for the public to use and different functionalities that you develop, that's kind of a, a better thing for organizing the actual thought flow of this kind of uh, process that is how people usually you know tend to use it. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I really okay. like I really yeah. like what you're doing with it. Um, okay, let's uh, go through a few others. So in terms of the, the shortcomings, we also saw the abstraction levels as a possible problem with the, with the data flow diagram. And especially at the point where you start relying on lower level layers and their security guarantees. So um, I take again the example of, of the encrypted there. Um, that would not tell you, and I, I think if I'm not mistaken, that something like the, the um, Microsoft threat modeling tool allows you to say for a certain data flow diagram, it's encrypted. But you should be able to cross the abstraction layer to, to know exactly what you are relying on. Is this encryption because the application builds it in? Is this encryption because you're using TLS? Is this encryption through IPsec at the lower level? And this also relates to the way you where you can use stride and i don't know whether this is something that comes up in practice or not but the the threats of stride are really related across these abstraction levels so you can have a spoofing threat at the network level which might then lead to an information disclosure level at uh, information disclosure threat at, at the application level and i don't know of a good way to to model this and i also don't know whether these kind of things pop up in practice. So if you would be threat modeling here, would you always be looking at just the application level or does it sometimes happen where you say, okay, you can have a, a spoofing threat that leads to information disclosure? Any thoughts or experiences with, with that particular part? I think for uh, most of us, it starts at the application level uh, because that's in the end where you can uh, easiest show the business impact and you need a business impact in order for business to approve a budget to actually fix things. Uh, we do do threat models on uh, supporting architecture 
for, uh, let's say, networking in general, but these are uh, not the places where most companies start. They will start at application level. And then when they get more mature, they will start threat modeling, supporting things, processes, uh, and, and all these kinds of things. Yeah. But would you then, my feeling is, especially for the spoofing threat, for instance, that spoofing is always the first step towards something else. The spoofing by itself will probably not be a problem. It's because through the spoofing, you can have information disclosure or tampering or uh, denial of service or repudiation. But the real threats are the, the tried part and the S by itself is always a, mean to, a means to achieve it. Uh, unless you need data quality and then uh, spoofing data doesn't necessarily uh, give information disclosure, but your data quality will go down. And if you're thinking about an AI system, even if they don't change any data, but uh, the source of the data gets changed, so it gets a higher uh, a higher confidence in, in the system for some reason, then it will mess up the results of your system uh, as well. Plus you need the to cover spoofing if you want to have a look at both repudiation and uh, the elevation of privilege, because both of them assume that you have correct identification for which the negative is spoofing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then I'll uh, quickly go to um, the, the last shortcoming, which is related to the previous. It's the information on the deployments and the impact of that on, on the attacker model. So you can use trust boundaries for that. But as we've seen, trust boundaries already have uh, or can have some different meanings than, than just deployment. So we think it would be beneficial to separate the different roles of, of trust boundaries in this is deployment, this is a uh, certain privilege level um, and the other uses that we, we also describe in the paper. Okay, so why do we think that it's important to make these things explicit? Uh, I took a quote from a, a book which is uh, in a totally different domain, but it says you cannot answer a question that you cannot ask and you cannot ask a question that you have no words for. So translate to threat modeling, that would mean how are you going to assess or evaluate the impact of implementing a countermeasure uh, based on your model if that countermeasure itself is absent from your model. So that touches back on, on the previous discussion. So we believe that it should aim for, uh, a threat model should aim for a rich model where the countermeasure, the threats and all the relationships between them are part of that model and not just uh, some arbitrary uh, free text, so to speak. So this information is uh, relevant for creating the model, for reproducing it, for uh, traceability reasons. What happens if you want to update your threat model? You need to be able to retrieve it. And also, if you're looking at automation, um, you need this kind of information. So I'm convinced that this kind of information is already present uh, for everybody who does threat modeling. So um, maybe a question to ask is where do you keep that information now? In what form can you retrieve it? And when do you ever revisit it? For instance, the assumptions, do you revisit them to check whether they're still uh, valid or not? So in the end, what we um, envision is that there's room for a spectrum of uh, modeling languages. So we have the, the data flow diagrams, which are very easy to, to adopt. They're uh, easy to understand for lots of stakeholders, but they're not really tailored towards threat modeling. On the other hand, we think it's possible to have uh, a language that helps you more uh, with the threat modeling, with more explicit concepts for threat modeling, but it might be more difficult to, to adopt these things. Um, the intersection of both, so both the high level of support and the ease of adoption, we don't believe that there will be anything there. So it will be a trade-off, it's balancing the different forces um, and we don't believe there will be a one-size-fits-all language, but just DFDs, according to us, um, are not enough to serve as a, a basis for threat modeling. 
So I'd like to conclude with a few uh, strong statements, the ones I've actually made before throughout the presentation. So we believe that threat modeling currently is at a low uh, level of maturity. Data flow diagrams do not suffice for systematic and reproducible threat modeling, and that we should invest in better models uh, coupled with tool assistance based on these models and knowledge bases. That's um, our position. Um, I think we can uh, open the floor if there are any more questions or remarks. So, as I've said before, we're interested in your concerns as a practitioner, things that we're not taking into account that you really think uh, we should, if there are problems with threat modeling that you, um, you don't know how to solve, but um, you want us to research even if we didn't cover it at all in this presentation, we would be very interested in, in hearing those. So Martin, so, okay. oh, Martin you, can, you can voice it yourself if you want. It was Jonathan, but go ahead, Didier. <laughs> okay, uh, so Martin was asking, anyone tried using Archimate to build and maintain threat models? Anyone from the from the participants? I personally didn't look at it yet. It's one of the tracks we're trying to look at. Um, things like Archimate or uh, the C4 model for uh, for software architecture to see how that can serve as a basis for threat modeling. It's one of the things we we want to investigate uh, soon. One of the uh topics that was discussed uh, either two or three summits ago uh, around threat modeling was good enough threat modeling you know what is the how uh, what is the the amount of threat modeling that your engineering teams find valuable that will provide sufficient improvements to the product uh, or system uh, but is not too onerous and that's that's a really tricky balance, you know, having seen very big threat models in the past, uh, down to, you know, much smaller ones, which are done in half an hour, that there, there won't be a right answer, but that is a factor of, you know, is, is the method or the tooling appropriate for a good enough threat model that your uh, engineering teams or product teams will, uh, are happy to invest the appropriate time in. Yeah, so would that mean something tooling that doesn't require everything to be perfect? Not all information is in there, but you can do um, partial things or focus on on a few things or it uh so there was a uh um Sorry, winding back this a couple of years. One of the discussions that came out of uh, the summit two or three years ago was very lightweight threat modeling process. That was three questions or four questions that could be asked of each um, uh, each user story. Uh, that was um, uh, that was being reviewed. Uh, so something that you could do very very quickly from a tooling perspective or from a methodology perspective. Um, something. Uh, with with engineering teams that are moving uh, moving relatively quickly, a heavyweight tooling and a heavyweight process is not something that will be easily adopted. Um, mm -hmm. It will vary by industry. You know, obviously in, in safe in the in the safety or the high high uh, high re highly regulated environments, they'll there is more requirement for for that detailed thing, but. Having, having tooling or a process that adapts or can adapt in, the, in situations where you have different amounts of time your dev team or your engineering team are willing to accept these, or willing to invest is a is pretty important factor. Yeah. I think it also relates a bit to the metrics. Like you need to be able to define what is what is good? Uh, how would you measure good, or how would you define this is good enough, so that you know that you can stop? Yeah, I would uh, 
note is there that it's not going to, or at least in theory, not going to be up to the dev teams or the engineers to decide that. So the, uh, the business or the organization as a whole has an appetite, uh, a risk appetite, and that yep. risk appetite is going to decide when it is good enough. So if you're a medical device manufacturer or if you're a NASA, it, the risk appetite is going to be different than if you're a startup that needs to go first to market. And, yep. and it's, it's the business that will decide when it's good enough. Now, of course, we'll need to provide them with sufficient information to make that decision because when somebody from the business looks at a threat model, they will have no idea. So we'll, we'll still need to work together, which is one of the, the primary things in threat modeling, of course. But yeah, that, that's basically where, where we say the, uh, the cutoff point is. Yeah, I, I, my, my comment more around engineering is I'm kind of assuming that things like product management exist within the engineering org uh, and that they collectively own the product or the system or the business so i mean I, I i think we're saying the same thing just in different ways around organization structure yeah maybe to to add on to that I, well basically we already mentioned the same thing it, it really depends on metrics and it's really tricky because even when as you say, you have some some really high impact uh, application and you need to have as little risk as possible. It will never be perfect. You can never have a 100% guarantee, but what can you have? So it's, it's, it's really tricky to find something for that. There is a response in the chat window, uh, not to your question, Kim, but to Martin's question about Archimate. Um, so the SAPSA tools and papers on modeling SAPSA with Archimate. So there's uh, some uh, tooling um, or articles about uh, doing, uh, doing it, apparently. OK, thanks for that. Um, any more questions or comments or discussions? I am conscious we only have five minutes left. And oh, good. And I just posted um, the link to the next session, which is in five minutes. Uh, we will be joined by Steve and um, was it Mike? Mike Goodman? Goodwin. Mike Goodwin to talk about some threat modeling tools. Um, so I guess we can close this session. I will need the organizers to stay a bit further so that we can uh, do a debrief video with you guys together. Um, but other than that, the rest of you, thank you so much and hopefully see you in the next session. Thank you. Thanks yeah, for joining. Bye,